All right. Um, hi, I'm Erica Borgard. I'm the uh, moderator and also participant in this panel, which is about the Cyberspace Solarium Commission. So I will be uh, dual-hatted here. I'm a, uh, my, my regular job is as an assistant professor at the Army Cyber Institute, but um, currently I'm serving as a, a senior director and lead for Task Force One on the Cyberspace Solarium Commission. So on this panel, we have um, the executive director of our commission um, and other members um, of the Solarium Commission, and so we're going to talk a little bit about the work that we've been doing over the past few months what the trajectory is for, uh, for the future, and really look forward to your questions about the work that we're doing. So I thought we could start off with the panelists introducing themselves, and then um, I'll kick the first question off to Mark. But do you want to go ahead? Thanks. Uh, Mark Montgomery. I'm the executive director. Uh, came from the Senate Armed Services Committee, where I was policy director for Senator John McCain for two years. Prior to that, I was a uh, retired uh, Navy Rear Admiral, did about 32 years in the surface Navy. Uh, Brandon Valeriano, I'm the Chair of Military Innovation at the Marine Corps University. I am a Senior Fellow at the Cato Institute, and I'm a Senior Advisor with the Cyberspace Solarium Commission. Thank you all for coming. My name is Ben Jensen. I'm a Professor of Strategic Studies at the Marine Corps University School of Advanced Warfighting, and I also hold an appointment at American University in the School of International Service. And I am also the Mandalorian. <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, I don't get the reference, but... But I'm gonna I'm gonna roll with it. No. So. We don't know his identity no. yet. Don't spoil it. <laughs> God, that was amazing. Um, anyway, so uh, so today we're gonna be talking about the work we're doing for Solarium. So Mark, maybe you could kick it off and give everyone a little bit of background on what the commission is, who the commissioners are, um, how we're organized, what we're doing, what our timeline looks like. Sure. Thanks. So um, I'll try to get to you in five minutes. The uh, so we were set up by the last year's National Defense Authorization Act. Um, you know, Senator McCain didn't like commissions that much, but he recognized that uh, this issue is one of these, uh, how we defend the national critical infrastructure against cyber attacks as a significant consequence was an interagency problem that is a big challenge for the executive branch to think about and for the leg legislative branch to provide oversight and support for. And he recognized that 85% of our critical infrastructure, national security critical infrastructure, sat outside of the normal uh, DOD or Department of Defense um, uh, defended boundaries. So he recognized that a commission that could provide uh, broad, uh, you know, um, kind of whole society feedback on the best way to defend the critical infrastructure was necessary. Uh, we have 14 commissioners, pretty unique. We have four active legislators. That's going to be important later on. We actually were briefed early in the commission by a couple. Um, uh, fellows that had done their PhDs and one had even hit, written a book on how you um, on how you run a federal commission or with the effect of a federal commission. I didn't even know that was something people would study, but they studied it. And what they determined was that if a commission wasn't coming right in the wake of a of a dramatic event like the 9/11 Commission, only a small percentage of its recommendations get done. And even among those, it's really just the low hanging fruit. The one exception is if you have active legislators on the commission. Um, and uh, we're lucky we have four legislators, two senators, Senator King and Sass, so an independent who caucuses with Democrats and a Republican, and then Representative uh, Langevin and Representative Gallagher, so a Democrat and a Republican. So one of each, uh, three of the four sit on the Armed Services Committee. So if we come to consensus-based conclusions that the four congressmen think can be reasonably turned into law, we have a much higher likelihood of getting things done either using the National Defense Authorization Act or independent freestanding legislation. Um, so those four legislators are critical. We also have four executive branch representatives, the Deputy Secretary of Defense, Homeland Security, and um, the Deputy Director of National Intelligence and the Director of the FBI. So really for the subject matter experts of the government on how we get, uh, senior subject matter experts about how we get at, uh, how we organize ourselves for cybersecurity. They've all been very beneficial. Obviously their staffs assist as well. So I think that's been a, a good system. Having legislators and executive branch members on, a, on the same commission is unusual and not recommended uh, in terms of you know, getting things done, uh, in terms of some legality issues associated, but in terms of um, getting the right briefs to the right people has been fantastic. Then beyond that, we have six civilians. Um, it, uh, they, are, uh, they come from either academia, uh, think tanks, or business. Um, and we have a Fortune 50 company CEO as one of our commissioners, so a good broad mix among 14 commissioners. 
And um, we've tackled uh, this issue of what's the right strategy um, uh, to defend our national security critical infrastructure against a major cyber attack, and then what are the right policy recommendations to get at it. So that's broadly what we're looking at. I think you know, the strategy would be a good discussion point here, but equally important to us is the policy recommendations, and then of those policy recommendations, which ones can become legislative proposals and get done rapidly. Because one of the issues we've seen in studying previous commissions is a lot of great ideas out there, and then they're repeated from commission to commission because they don't get executed um, in the follow-up. So I'm happy, I think we'll all discuss what those, what that strategic approach and what the recommendations are over the next hour. Yeah, and then just to give a little bit of historical background, um, you may be wondering why we're called the Cyberspace Solarium Commission. The name is supposed to harken back to Eisenhower's Project Solarium, which was, um, which he set up during sort of the early days of the Cold War when we were trying to figure out the best strategic approach to addressing a similarly systemic threat, albeit with a lot of differences, right? But the idea is to have um, sort of these competitive, um, uh, or Eisenhower's idea was to have these uh, three different task forces, each of which would present a sort of logically consistent and unique strategic approach to addressing the Soviet threat, and then he would be the sort of decision maker to figure out which of these approaches would then drive his, um, his administration's grand strategy. Uh, we are organized in a similar way. We have three task forces, um, although um, given the nature of, uh, you know, given the sort of multi-stakeholder multi nature of cyberspace and um, the challenges that we face, we're sort of less of a competitive, uh, three competitive task forces and more sort of three different lenses for examining the strategic challenge. And so um, at, at the end of the day, our strategic approach, which we'll, we'll talk about in a little bit, will be a, um, a compilation and sort of cohesion of these different, um, different task forces approaches. So um, I don't know if you want to talk a little bit about what the task force is, what each task force is doing, and then I can talk a little bit about task force one. Sure. So the three task forces, uh, task force one and Erica is the task force lead for that. She'll talk to in a second. Um, looked at, uh, was assigned to look at it through the lens of uh, active disruption and uh, defend forward persistent engagement, and she'll talk to some of those issues. Uh, and, and cost and, and how you do deterrence by cost and position. Task Force 2 looked largely at how you do deterrence by denial. What are, the, what are the ways to improve the resilience of our economy? I mean, resilience of our cyber um, space. What's, uh, uh, and um, uh, what, what are the best ways to build a better cyber ecosystem? And what laws, uh, what, what uh, regulation or systemic changes would be required to, um, to create a, uh, a more secure environment for all businesses to operate in? And, uh, and um, also how to build a better private uh, pr uh, collaboration with the private sector, particularly among information sharing, but across a whole litany of issues. I'd say within there, you know, there's 20 to, between those three pillars, there's 20 to 25 pretty um, relevant and significant um, uh, legislative proposals. And, and I think that's where the majority of our, the vast majority of our legislative proposals come from. Um, uh, another, uh, a third task force looked at um, at uh, how we can use norm, how we can use norms in international regimes and the non-military instruments of power, which are pretty vast for the United States, to create a uh, a safer um, uh, cyber uh, safer environment in the uh, in cyberspace for us, and you know, some significant uh, thinking there on how we improve State Department's uh, organization uh, to get at this. Um, what's the right seniority of the um, of our senior cyber policymaker, and then also how we work with our allies and partners um, uh, to uh, to create either norms or create an agreed upon um, approaches to law enforcement, uh, economic and uh, diplomatic activity in cyberspace. Finally, we did have a directorate for that looked at one significant pillar, and that's how we reorganize the U.S. government. We were specifically tasked with looking is the U.S. government properly organized. And in, in many, in several areas, we we were making strong recommendations on how you improve existing things. Let's be clear: the federal government's made a lot of change. We created a uh, sub-unified command and then a unified command, Cybercom. Uh, we created uh, CISA, the um, uh, the uh, cybersecurity, um, uh, the the cybersecurity uh, infrastructure security, cybersecurity information security agency, um, and uh, and we 
created CTIC uh, within the intelligence agency and a number of other smaller organizations that have really gotten at this issue. Having said that, some of those organizations aren't performing at the efficiency and effectiveness they originally envisioned. And uh, some of them, their remit should have expanded as the threat got more comprehensive. So we have some recommendations on how to improve existing organizations. And we do have some recommendations on new organizations, either at the strategic level in terms of leadership and oversight of cyber at the White House level and also um, at the kind of more operational level about how we organize ourselves for defensive cyber operations. So good recommendations there that the commissioners are working through right now, so we can't provide too many of the details. But that fourth group is looking at the reorganization of the US, at the organization of the US government and what are ways to be more effective. All right, so, and then Task Force One. Yeah, so Task Force One, um, as Mark mentioned, is focused on um, active disruption, defense forward, and persistent engagement. And um, uh, Brandon and I work together on this task force, so he'll talk a little bit about, um, he'll, he'll get into some of the, of the details after I sort of uh, go over some of the big moving, uh, moving, moving parts of our task force. Um, and what's really fascinating, just uh, thinking about uh, the uniqueness of this commission, what was unique about it was not just the 14 commissioners that we have a sort of bipartisan, bicameral, um, legislative, executive, civilian uh, comprised commission, but in terms of our task force structure, we have a mix of detailees from different departments and agencies. We have academic subject matter experts. Um, so it, it's really, um, we really, I think the commission kind of matches the, the personnel of the commission match the diversity of um, stakeholders who have, uh, who have something to say about, about this challenge. Um, so, so with respect to Task Force One, we really are focused, uh, we are, our research was focused on three specific questions. The first is sort of articulating what is the strategic logic of Defend Forward? How has it been implemented thus far? And what are the sort of gaps and challenges and issues that remain where we as a commission can um, kind of uh, speak to and address? The second question is, um, as the United States is, uh, you know, putting forth this new strategic concept and starting to operationalize it, how can we more proactively and deliberately address the different types of risks that emerge um, as we sort of do strategy in a new and different way? Um, and, so, uh, and so we had a whole line of effort that was focused on addressing in particular concerns about escalation risks. And then the third question um, was focused on how we can pre prepare to prevail in times of crisis and conflict. And sort of this, this addressed the intersection of cyberspace with the conventional and even the, the nuclear domains, understanding that we are in an environment of great power competition. And the reality is that um, you know, any, uh, any crisis or conflict above the use of force threshold will inevitably involve and contain a cyber component, either as um, a function of um, vulnerabilities and risks in um, conventional and nuclear platforms or as sort of an independent strategic um, effect in conjunction with um, conventional capability. So, um, so, so we sort of, our task force explored sort of below the use of force threshold, um, approaching crisis and conflict and above, above that threshold. Um, and so for Defend Forward in particular, um, what we, uh, our, our task force produced this uh, extensive, um, a strategic approach document where we kind of articulate what the logic of Defend Forward is. Um, and really what we are trying to clarify for the commissioners is that this strategic concept um, addresses the, the fact that the United States has um, thus far been able to deter strategic cyber attacks above the use of force threshold. So, um, and, and that's likely because our, so we have credible retaliatory response options for those types of events. The challenge really has been that uh, we haven't deterred a range of malicious behavior that doesn't rise to the level of war, but that in the aggregate has real strategic significance for the United States. And it's those areas where our um, conventional credible deterrent capabilities aren't a great fit. Um, and so things like this, uh, th these include things such as uh, large scale cyber enabled intellectual property theft. or cyber-enabled influ um, influence operations, or um, efforts to hold our critical infrastructure risk in cyberspace. These don't rise to the level of war, and we, we haven't yet had um, a good sort of strategic framework um, and figured out the tools to address that type of adversary behavior. And so we sort of situate our task force report in that context. 
Um, and, and so the logic, defend forward in its relationship to deterrence is meant to fill that gap of where um, deterrence has, uh, has, has failed. And so um, what, we, what we try to articulate is, um, is that because, um, because of the, both because of how our adversaries operate in cyberspace and because of the global and geographic and interconnected nature of the domain, um, a sort of reactive and response posture is insufficient to address these types of threats. And therefore, the sort of forward part of deterrence, of, of defend forward, is that the United States needs to be um, um, forward thinking both in its sort of strategic planning as well as forward operationally to pursue adversaries as they maneuver, understand how they're developing as dynamic or as dynamic entities, and also ideally um, impose uh, costs against adversary um, offensive capabilities and, and their sort of um, the organizations that support them before they can rise to the level of posing a, a major challenge to the United States. Um, and I think what's interesting about the defend forward concept and what we learned over the course of our research is that there's a lot of confusion about what it actually is um, and what it means in its application. And so, um, you know, we, we worked really hard to try to clarify that whether we did a good job or not, uh, you all will able, be able to see when our uh, commission report eventually gets made public in the spring of 2020. Um, but I, I think one of the misnomers is, is that defend forward is a um, sort of aggressive and offensive strategy. Um, and really at the strategic level, it's an inherently defensive one, right? The strategic objective of defend forward is to, um, is to defend those critical parts of our economy and national security that are being um, sort of corrosively threatened by this malicious day-to-day -day behavior. Um, however, in its operational and tactical application, there are offensive elements to it. And so I think we need to do a better job of sort of disaggregating strategic, operational, and tactical levels when we think about um, what these uh, new concepts mean. Um, another, another sort of misnomer, or um, uh, I guess misnomer is the right word, uh, that, that we've learned in the course of doing research about Defend Forward is that um, it is a new concept for, um, for, for the US government for cyberspace. But forward defense has long-standing historical roots. And so I think especially when the US government um, communicates with allies and partners about what defend forward is and what it means, um, we need to do a better job of situating it in historical context. We did forward defense during the Cold War. It was a central aspect of our um, extended deterrence and how we worked with NATO. And so kind of situating it in that historical narrative is um, is important. So I want to turn over to Brandon because um, maybe you can talk a little bit about some of the um, some of the gaps and challenges that we've sort of identified in our research and thinking about defend forward and, and how we can think about mitigating them. Sure. And I would say the main challenge is right now defend forward is basically a whole department strategy and we need to move towards a whole government strategy. We need to get all leverage of national power on the same page and that's something we hope to accomplish to streamline and align our strategy in a cohesive manner where it all works together. And then at that point we can start to think about a whole society strategy, but we're not really on the same page in government. And that's something we need to clarify. We need to make a we need to make it more clear externally because signaling is a key aspect of any national strategy and we haven't done very well on that so far. So hopefully we'll move forward and come up with a clear and cohesive uh, and constructive signaling plan. The other thing is we were thinking quite a bit about escalation because I think a lot of people have too many assumptions about escalation in this domain and there's not a lot of deep knowledge about the process. And I think that's really critical, understanding the probability of escalation in relation to who the actors are. Because blanket statements about how this domain works doesn't, don't really make sense unless you contextualize them based on who the actors are. So that was another big issue for us. But I think, uh, metrics? Or? Metrics, yeah. And then the last thing is metrics and evaluation. Looking at the history of national innovation, there's always been a problem with historical analysis and looking at data as it happens. And I think a lot of failures in innovation have really been failures to analyze the data and to really think about how causality and correlation work. 
And then one thing that we're, we're really concerned about is evaluation and metrics, making sure our strategy is actually working as it's implemented. And that's something we really want to institutionalize in the US government as we move forward to make sure that when we put things into operation, we're actually monitoring to see if they're working, see what we do need to do to tailor them and construct them in a way that make them more effective. But that's a key question for us. And we have to move away from the current kind of discourse where everyone debates evaluation and effectiveness in lawfare, war on the rocks, and whatnot. We need to really think about how to do this in a constructive manner that's empirically valid and verified. And that's something we want to hope to move towards. So I want to pull the thread a little bit on signaling. Could you maybe explain, because signaling is kind of a term of art, mm -hmm. um, what that means and why it's important in the context of, um, of defend forward? Well, the whole purpose of our strategy is really to get people to not do something or to possibly even change their behavior. So it's either deterrent or compel it. In some ways, we're doing both at the same time. But either way you develop a coercive strategy, you have to tell the opposition what you want them to do or not do. And we haven't been very good strategically at thinking about that issue, thinking about how we signal the opposition about what we want them to do to modify their behavior. So that's been a really key pillar of the research we need to do and the research we're pushing out, to think about how signaling can be done, to think about getting all levers of national power together, to think about getting the Department of State to work more closely with the Department of Defense in constructing a forward defensive strategy for cyberspace. Yeah, and just to add on that, I think it's um, signaling is important for adversaries. It's also important for allies and partners. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's one one thing that we've seen. We've done a lot of trips to uh, international engagements. We went to the UK, um, Israel, Estonia. Where else have we gone? We didn't go there. And we'll be doing we'll be, we'll be doing a series of other international engagements after we kind of wrap up this uh, portion of our of our work. But um, you know, signaling is important not just to um, affect the adversary's decision calculus, but also to uh, make sure that we, um, that our allies and partners understand what this, uh, what this concept is about and, um, and that we do, we do a better job when possible of sort of coordinating and working uh, together with allies and partners. Um, the interesting thing also about signaling in the context of Defend Forward is that um, I think a lot of times when we think about signaling, we think about it only at the strategic level. Um, and so we think about sort of formal diplomatic mechanisms for signaling, whether they're public or private. Um, but especially in cyberspace, because um, uh, cyber operations in themselves are not great tools of signaling, um, it's hard to discern and tend and understand uh, what the purpose of, um, of an operation may be. And that could be because the domain is new. It could be because of inherent factors associated with cyberspace. Um, or it could be a combination of those things, uh, we need to do a better job of developing what we call in Task Force One a multi-tiered signaling strategy. So not just thinking about signaling at the strategic level, but also at the operational and tactical level and how we couple cyber and non-cyber non tools of signaling at those levels too. Um, so it's not, it's not just the sort of strategic communications and strategic signaling piece of things. Um, but I wanna turn it over to Ben to talk a little bit about um, sort of uh, the, the process, our Solarium event, and the work that you're doing on kind of pulling the threads together and figuring out how we take Task Force One, Task Force Two, Task Force Three, Directorate Four, and somehow through some magic, um, really systemic social science, right, um, turn this into a commission report. So um, maybe you could talk a little bit about the Solarium event and our process sure. going into that, and then like what you're working on right now. Uh, it's really three words. Uh, Erica, intellectual dogwood sandwich. Let's put them all together. Um, no, all seriousness aside, what I want to do is really stress one dimension as I kind of frame it to continue my panelist theme, and that's context and opportunity. Um, there are very important contextual factors at play in relation to strategic competition that I think are enduring but often under theorized, where maybe academics haven't served policymakers. And policymakers are usually too busy lying to themselves in memoirs to reflect upon those more difficult moments. And then two, how new technology might alter attributes of those contextual factors in relation to strategic competition to make it potentially a new game. And then last, and I really want to stress this especially to like, you know, the young men and women in uniform in this room, opportunity. What type of responsibility do you have to a republic when you see the character of competition changing to actually do something about it. 
and what does that look like? And that's really gonna encapsulate what I'll say. So I'll say first, at a personal contextual level, I don't think I've ever told any of you this, um, when I was a first lieutenant, I met Senator McCain. Um, I was in a country far, far away, and we were part of a congressional delegation, which is a horrible exercise you'll probably have to do in some godforsaken counterinsurgency place 10, 15 years from now. But essentially, you meet legislators and you tell them about what's going on. And some of them, it's a really interesting and open exchange. Others, it's very much a Potemkin village. And the one thing that struck me was the brutal honesty and sincerity of a veteran like Senator McCain. It made that dynamic fundamentally different and frankly raised the caliber of the conversation. And that was a moment for me where I realized the importance of what's at stake and how a willingness to speak truth to power, how a willingness to deeply analyze things was a direct contribution to national security. As much as new line items in a budget, as much of any of that, it was a certain habit of mind and sense of service. And so coming to this, really, that always stuck with me. And think about the contextual factors you heard the uh, executive director bring up, right? This is a unique type of animal. If you study strategy a lot, we often create too many black boxes and kind of straw men where it's either the kind of deus ex machina, brilliant thinker, the coup de nil that comes about and sees the situation clearly and articulates some grand strategy and everybody just marches along and does it. But those kind of great men myths are routinely debunked as we look at it closer. What you find is that most strategy emerges in a unique national, inter international, national, and bureaucratic context at multiple levels of analysis. And to understand the, in why the task force or were organized, why they were through the NDA, and how we do the event, I think we want to highlight some of those key contextual factors. Um, number one, I still don't think as academics or policymakers or military professionals, we fully grasp the ambiguity and complexity of strategic interaction. Uh, I think the original foundational work at the dawn of the nuclear era got us going in the right direction in terms of especially some of Thomas Schelling's work, but it quickly got bogged down in particular aspects of the Cold War as it evolved. So very interesting theory has an ideal type collided with a very muddy reality and made it difficult to discern what was really relevant in strategic interaction. To pick up the signaling thread, I'll give you one example. So Schelling talked about something called the interdependence of commitment. That meant that as two hypothetical states, almost like a, a game theory model, are evaluating each other in a bargaining situation. I want to get an advantage over you, you want to get an advantage over me, and we're smart. We want to get the most advantage short of actually committing the costly gamble that is warfare, right? Because once the guns start, People are gonna die, treasure will be spent, and we really don't know all of the ways this could unfold. Um, interdependence of commitment meant as you're assessing that bargaining situation that you would actually look to past practice and try to assess what had your adversary done in the past and was it relevant to the future? Well, that quickly butted up, and, and then you could also signal based upon that, right? You'd have an expectation of what they would do, you would know how hard, how soft, what instrument of power to theoretically use as the literature evolved. Well, quickly what we found as academics is that doesn't work. Um, a lot of literature starts to say that it really might be current contextual factors that matter more than even your expectations of past behavior. Um, so for example, what is that actor doing in that crisis at that moment? And I think that tension in the literature is especially relevant as our first contextual factor for what's unique about cyber competition as it relates to strategic competition. Two states engage in strategic competition, great power competition. We make global campaign plans now, right? We have an entire office for strategic competition directed at one actor in particular. Well, they're doing that both in relation to that past iteration, but they're doing it connected across networks that are predominantly owned by civilian actors. So this creates a certain degree of interdependence and leverage that's fundamentally different than what we've had in the past. And that degree of interdependence is potentially what you might call complex dependence. It means the savvy actor can find ways of using those interactions to their advantage. But unlike traditional deterrence, they can't stop it. It's not a dichotomous variable of one or zero. You either act or don't act. It's a question of the changed behavior over time that could be measured, often in terms of severity or frequency. Do you alter the attack profile of certain actors while engaged in strategic competition? So that's the first contextual factor that we have to conceptualize, how just connectivity itself, not just technologically enabled, shape strategic interactions and the estimates you make about a strategic adversary. Um, number two is that those networks are so fundamentally important to each of our lives that they quickly eclipse how we normally think about the, the rights of an individual in a state 
and even larger questions of sovereignty. So it means that we wonder how much the state should protect us, how much is, or is it our responsibility through cyber hygiene? Like, where are those degrees of permission? How far do they go? Where do those authorities reside at the federal government, at the state government? There are complex authorities issues and jurisdictional issues that cut across this that can't be easily wished away. And frankly, sometimes revolve on very deep philosophical questions about things like privacy versus security that you just can't wish away. So that's that second contextual factor. In this connected domain where you're both competing and you're both connected, it also alters how you conceptualize what a state even does to secure its own interests in that. And then third, I think that there's a series of kind of longer term trends that if we look out into the future, that will only amplify these. I think we're probably just at the precipice of a radical acceleration further in connectivity that will only cloud these issues further. So that's when we start to think to throw around a, a, a devil of a buzzword. It's the worst kind of buzzword because it combines a number and a letter, 5G, right? <laughs> so in theory, your shoes will talk to you, your fridge will judge you, um, your favorite socks will love you, right? But you'll have everything connected, which only magnifies the number of attack surfaces and possibility of manipulating it. So you also have very different security challenges when you look at the structure of some of those networks and how it relates to these larger trends. Now I say all that to establish this landscape of how does a government grapple with that type of Gordian knot? We, we can't pull Alexander's sword out and just cut it in half and pretend like the Russians joke that they're gonna just completely disconnect themselves. You have to find some way of living in a connected world, staying true to the traditions that made you a republic and actually posturing yourself as this only further accelerates. And so to try to grapple with those, what we did is looking carefully at the kind of original solarium is start to document, well, how did they approach it? And from really pulling all the archival records and looking at it, the first thing they did was try to think of mutually exclusive approaches. Three different task force organized <coughs> around a common kind of threat picture. Now, one thing we found as we dug in, just nerd out with me for a second, is that actually each of those task force didn't really have a common threat picture. There was a lot of staff officers presupposing what they thought the largest threat was, which is why you never underestimate the power of a staff to steer a process, because they're working all the documents and it can kind of shape it. Number two is that even if there ever were an individual that I would claim truly rises to the hagiographic hey standard of a quote unquote great man with true coup de nil, it would definitely be General Eisenhower, but even there, he did the most classic example of human satisficing. Right? You're gonna find when you give a commander, when you give a, a captain of a ship, <coughs> a brigade commander, courses of action, you give them three choices, they're like a kid at, dinner, uh, at ice cream time. Right? If you give them three flavors of ice cream, 50% of the ki time, the kid's just gonna wanna eat a little bit of each flavor. They'd eat all of them if you'd let them. And then sometimes they'll just so hate it, oh, get that rum rose raisin away from me, they'll only eat one ice cream. So oftentimes, people tend to the minority of people satisfice and pull bits of each strategy together. And despite what's written about it, if you look closely at the original solarium, that instinct was there. There were aspects of each of those in theory distinct approaches to sustaining strategic competition to shape Soviet decision making so you could advance American interests without risking nuclear war. And so as we set about this, honestly, we set up to let each task force be independently evaluated by a mix of red teams, so the commissions could decide which approach they wanted. But I think our thinking evolved along the way, that it was never going to be just one task force. It was never just going to be, I can only defend forward. And ignore the tremendous amount of diplomacy required to work with international standards regimes, work with partner countries, the law enforcement aspects that are critical of here. I can't just say resilience and retreat to create a defense in depth organized only around the resiliencies of my critical infrastructure networks. That there would be some combination of shaping the environment through defend forward, so kind of traditional um, reconnaissance, but really network reconnaissance as cyber network exploitation or ISR, as well as operational preparation of the environment, followed by a deterrence by denial approach, so target hardening. How would I make it more costly for you to achieve an effect so that you're more, less likely to do it over time? And then third, 
preserving this capability through that shaping of the environment at a time and place of your choosing to use some exquisite capabilities uh, complementing other instruments of power to advance your national interest. And so that's honestly the kind of rough strategic outline that's pulling together at this point aspects. Now, no plan survives first contact, so that hasn't been to a second red team. That hasn't been approved by our commissioners, so that's one random academic's speculation at this point. But that's really how we got there, is letting very smart people reflecting this whole of nation approach, so civilians, civil servants, military officers, academics, let them God wrestle. Let them struggle with big ideas. Let them think about these horrible strategic questions where there frankly is no good answer. It's all about opportunity costs. And in the process of doing that over two months, and really 200, when we get the number, it was like over 250 multi-hour engagements with a wide range of subject matter experts. So think if you're doing research methods, semi-structured interviews, lining up different observations and trying to coherently organize them to evaluate a proposition, the proposition being their core strategic approach, we then took those in to the commission. And I think to the, the, till their last dying breath, the task force leads will hate me for how that went down, but it really was aptly called a, you. a murder you. board. It's okay. Right? Imagine, no, I want you to think about this, because they're troopers. I mean, they are tough. So you have 14 of these folks, senators, congressmen, senior officials, deputy secretary of defense, senior FBI officials, <laughs> and yet you're sitting on a stage like this, and they're staring at you all day, and you're flanked. So you're being literally intellectually enveloped by red teams. Yes. And Wait, I don't want to relive this memory. I don't, I don't know I'm why sorry. we're doing I'm this sorry. trip down memory lane here. That Trigger. was like a month ago. <laughs> so, no, but I just want to show for you that there was a very rigorous process that went into this. And it really shows the kind of intellectual fortitude and dedication of the people to survive that degree of scrutiny. And again, why is that important? Because back to the original part, each of us has a responsibility to think about questions of grand strategy and security in a connected age. And you can't wish that away. It ha ideas have to live in the light. That's why this has to be unclassified. Yeah. That's because ideas have to live in the light. The marketplace of ideas needs to utterly scrutinize and reject half of what we write so we can collectively get better. It can't just be people in dark rooms coming up with good ideas, because I got a lot of historical examples of how that goes. Um, and it doesn't really end well. So to sum up, what matters? Context. What do you do when you have to grapple with these larger strategic questions? You identify the contextual factors that shape decision making, and you start to organize around them to maximize strategic opportunities. I'll turn it back. Yeah, thanks, Ben. And so, so just to sort of situate you all and where we are in our timeline, um, which I think you, you, you yeah. kind, of, kind of alluded to. So we, we started this process um, many, many months ago. Um, each task force had a team of researchers. We did a lot of external engagement. Um, we put together these task force reports. We had this solarium event that was preceded by a week of red teaming um, where we had different external subject matter experts provide their um, excruciatingly candid feedback on our work <laughs> product. And we're talking, you know, retired uh, general officers, uh, former senior members of uh, past administrations, senior leaders in the private sector. So it was really, you know, for one's ego, um, uh, you know, a, a painful process. Um, and then we had the Solarium event where we uh, stress tested the strategic approaches in each task force against two different types of scenarios that, that uh, Ben, um, that, that Ben uh, sort of crafted using um, all, of the, all of the insight that he just um, discussed with you all. Um, and so one scenario was the sort of slow burn type of scenario and the task force leads had to um, you know, had to sort of explain on the spot how our, both our strategic approach as well as the specific legislative and executive um, policy recommendations would um, sort of prevent and mitigate and help respond to this, this scenario um, with questions from the commissioners and from the red teamers. And then we had a second scenario that was more of a sort of short, short sharp disruption, a break glass kind of scenario. And we did, repeated that exercise. And then the commissioners um, voted on, yeah. how, how many recommendations did we have? Oh, gee, too many. 100, something, some absurd number of, what was it? How many recommendations? About 170. 170 recommendations across all three task forces. And the commissioners had to rank, um, rank order their preferences based on how we did at the Solarium event. And then we took all that data 
and we analyzed it and we spit it back out to the commissioners and said, okay, here's what you all voted on. And now, um, just to kind of give you some context on where we are in the process, we are, Mark, maybe you want to talk about sort of what we're sure. doing right now um, after this sort of solarium um, event. So uh, the idea is to get down to a reasonable number of recommendations that we can put forward, turn into, maybe turn half of them into legislative proposals and half are good governance recommendations to the executive branch or the private sector. And so those 170, you know, uh, a lot of them have been aggregated, some have been dismissed, um, and um, some have been significantly edited. But we're basically, you know, trying to get ourselves down to 50 to 60 recommendations to then take to the next stage of red team, you know, another red team uh, session, and, um, and then another commissioner review. So the idea is to continue to refine and get tighter. Obviously, we're working closely with legislative staffs to see what's the art of the possible there. Um, but uh, re realistically, uh, you know, about another month, a month and a half, and we should have a firm idea on that. I think we're much closer to that on the strategic approach. After the Solarium event, there's a much um, stronger, not unanimity, but you know, kind of a consensus-based understanding of what the strategic approach ought to look like. I mean, this isn't, though, the Solarium event where Eisenhower was a decider of one and a pretty good decider. This is a group of 14, so we're not exactly there yet, but we're getting closer. And, but I'll also say, you know, Ike's, um, so the Solarium event didn't produce any, you know, product in October 1953. Rather, in April 1954 through June 1954, the uh, Eisenhower administration um, produced a series of internal um, strategic planning documents. I think at the time they were NSPDs, I think was the number, 162 or 152 was the big one, the new look strategy. But in addition, um, you know, there's a reasonable argument that the uh, foundations of uh, massive retaliation were based in the work of Task Force Charlie, I think it was Charlie, of the, uh, of the Solarium event. And then, and, and in fact, one of the arguments made was for what eventually, six or eight years later, became flexible deterrence. You know, that was an, ar an argument that was put up and then dismissed during the solarium discussion. So you can see that even when Ike said, I choose these portions of, of Task Force A, these portions of Task Force B, these portions of Task Force C, it wasn't for six or eight months before it evidenced itself in, a, in, in uh, explicit changes to national security uh, policy. So, um, and obviously it was refined over time, even Decisions he made were refined by facts on the ground as they changed in Korea, um, in Indochina, um, because some of the exact issues that they looked at were the ones that would have influenced how he responded to French requests for assistance in early 1954. So um, you can see that it'll take some period of time for us to digest ourselves down to the right number of policy recommendations. And again, we're a commission, not the executive branch, which means um, a good percentage of our stuff are good governance recommendations. Um, but a good percentage will be legislative, and if they're adopted, if, if there's a broader consensus on them among the legislators involved in those committees and then in the broader House and Senate, then, then they'll have the impact of change within about a year. And so kind of picking up on that, um, so we've, we've had the Solarium event, we are, we've consolidated the recommendations, we're sort of bringing them back to the commissioners. Um, to sort of re-litigate re and adjust and, and, and get to a product that 14 very different individuals um, who are all very senior with very different perspectives can agree on. Um, and and we're, we're ultimately going to produce this commission report and it will be, as Ben mentioned, um, you know, an unclassified report. The audience is meant to be sort of the broader public. Um, you know, this isn't, this isn't a sort of internal, super secretive government exercise. Um, but Mark, I just, I wanted to follow up and ask you um, if, you know, given where we are, if the commission could do, you know, a, a three or four, whatever number you like, you know, key things, like what, what do you think are the most impactful, maybe not the uh, most likely of being adopted, mm -hmm. um, but what are some of the most impactful things that we're kind of coalescing around? And, um, and, and, and what are the chances you see or the conditions under which we might actually be able to, to, uh, to achieve them? So I, I think um, if I picked a couple, you know, one or two from each pillar, I'd say, uh, or one from each pillar, I'd say that you know, uh, you know, in, in the area of <clears throat> resilience, I think one of the most important things we can do is better organize the government and private sector uh, for the uh, recovery from uh, a cyber event of significant consequence. 
you know, one of our commissioners has written uh, extensively on continuity of the economy, uh, so Dr. Samantha Ravage, and um, you know, the concept that um, similar to continuity of the presidency, continuity of the government, the government and the private sector have to work ahead of a time to have the standard operating procedures, kind of the playbooks, the thought process, the legal determinations about how you rapidly recover multiple lifeline uh, infrastructures following a significant cyber attack. So to me, the continuity of the economy is one of the big ones. How that evidence itself in the commission, we still have to work through. But you can read, um, you know, she's written extensively on this and certainly recently an op-ed advocating for it. And I think um, it's, it's a hard thing for the government to get its hands around um, and why an external commission helps with this is because no single a agency owns this. And the one that's probably be best at it, uh, the Department of Defense, is not the appropriate place to have it. So that makes it very hard for the federal government to, to, to kind of take those first steps. And so I think the commission could help with some legislative proposals there. Uh, a second one is, you know, we need to figure out what's the right size of the, in the task force one, what's the right size of the, na of the national mission force, um, you know, designed in 2013. Um, a lot has evidenced itself since 2013 uh, in terms of adversary behavior. Um, we, there's a strong push for support for Defend Forward, which as Brandon says, is an interagency, should be seen as an interagency effort. There's Defend Forward and, uh, and, uh, and, and trade and, and um, economic sanctions, Defend Forward and law enforcement, Defend Forward and diplomatic engagement. But there's also a significant Defend Forward within the military, both in cyber and non-cyber. And that non-cyber <coughs> aspect is gonna have an impact. So in my mind, the CMF probably needs to be reassessed. It might be that the assessments that the size is the right size. I, I find that hard to believe with the growth and adversary and uh, the kind of mission creep and what they're doing in, in different areas. Um, in, uh, in the norms area, I think the, there's, um, there's some good small ones about how we improve the uh, availability of uh, and the number and capacity of both our law enforcement and diplomatic engage, you know, cyber engagement overseas. You know, those you know, small investments can give long, can give large return there. And so there's some recommendations there. And then in the larger scale, is what's the proper organization in the State Department to execute the, the cyber deterrence initiative they've been assigned uh, by the interagency process. And then um, finally, in uh, in uh, organizations of government, I mentioned earlier that, that I think some element, as the government thinks about defense, counter cyber operations, countering operations, you know, helping the private sector, you know, when under a sustained um, cyber campaign from a, from a nation state, um, you know, how do we help, how do we bring our capacity, which is in one portion of the government, and our authorities, which is another portion of the government, together. And I don't think we've organized ourselves to that. I think we're very well organized on the offensive side. If you look, there's been recent articles and General Akasoni's commented on the, um, you know, the coupling of executive branch decisions uh, involving NSPM 13 and legislative branch decisions in the uh, fiscal year 19, uh, John S. McCain NDAA that gave, um, that, that treat uh, mili uh, surveillance and reconnaissance as a traditional military activity. When brought together, those have empowered so the offensive side of the mission you know, to kind of establish itself properly. I think on the defensive side, we're missing that same level of, uh, of integrated approach inside the federal government. And so um, I think there's an area where we'd have one. And uh, one more I talk about really getting into the private sector area is, um, is um, the government becoming more involved <laughs> in identifying and establishing the right standards, whether it's through some kind of um, uh, certifying and labeling you know, kind of similar to underwriter laboratories or, um, you know, the uh, food labeling, you know, that this is a product of a certain level quality. It wouldn't be the federal government doing it. We'd have to find some um, third party I interface between the government and the private sector that does that. But I think thinking about that, something the commission's coming around to, I think that's gonna be critical to getting a better um, ecosystem for the, for the operation of, uh, of the private sector, either small, medium, or large. And we have a lot more in there, but I think that the commissioners are still working their way around it and it'd be inappropriate to talk to the details at this time. Um, and so, Brandon, I want to sort of ask you um, a question about your experience working on this commission, especially uh, addressing some of the academics who are in the room, right? We, um, there's this uh, fr phrase that's repeated a lot about sort of you know, that there's some gap between academia and policy making, and how do, we, how do we bridge that gap? So maybe you can talk a little bit to your experience as an academic 
being, uh, you know, ha having the opportunity to help shape and influence um, policy making in a, you know, in a really impactful way, and what that means for how we think about the role of academia um, in, in in the policy space, and, and vice versa, and what you know, people in the room who are who are who are coming from an academic background, you know, what they can take away from from that experience. Yeah, well, there's a lot there with that comment. Um, good question. Uh, I don't think there's a gap. There is no gap. There's no gap to bridge. If anything, we are the bridge. The problem is, and as we come more and more to find out, is that there's limitations with academics, scholars in the community, think tanks. They're not thinking hard enough. They're not doing enough. They're not doing enough research. They're thinking too superficially. They're writing a thousand word articles that have one sentence to take away. That's not good enough. We need to do better. The challenge is that we need to really think about the depth of the research that's needed to come to a, a, to build a developed strategy that Ben is articulating very, very well. I think that's something that I want to come out from this process. The depth of the analysis. I always say we need to show our work. We need to go back. Every recommendation needs to be researched. We need to have a background to it. I think that's the most important thing. It's not about the inability of academics to engage in policy. It's that there's a general inability for people to think about new ideas in this innovative space, but also to think about implementation of ideas, how we get these things done, and how we make them work in the real world. Viability and feasibility, these two things. I've always had that mantra in intro to IR, and it makes sense very well here. I think that's really important to think about, is that in some ways there's a lot of jokes we make about academics, but really it's our fault that we're not doing enough. We're not engaging enough. We're not thinking enough. We're very self-interested, and we need to think very much differently about how we can serve our nation. And that's a challenge, and it takes time, it takes effort. We're gonna lose hair out of this, we're gonna go gray out of this. This is the month of our lives that feel like years, but it's an important <laughs> process. Ben, do you agree as one of the, the other academics sitting on the, on the, up on the stage here? I mean, I've, I've always been more the boss. I mean, I was, I was commissioned before I had my PhD, so I kind of have I'm <laughs> the worst of both worlds. Um, but I, I do think what Brandon's saying is important about rigor, and I don't think it's just a government official, there, there's a certain chattering class now that is doing no one any favors, except for maybe increasing their influencer status. Um, and, you know, a, a theory absent a observation to back it up is just speculation. An observation absent a theory of the case is just noise. Apparently Siri and the Chinese like it's that China. one. It's China, yeah. yeah. Um, but, and I think there's really something to that. It, it, we can't, we cannot use surface deep op-ed oriented outlets to hash out substantive strategy debates. I think they have a role of kind of developing ideas, but ideally they'd be based upon much more substantive study and practice. And unfortunately that doesn't seem to be the case. It's often lead with the headline, and if it gains enough traction, pretend you have a research program. And so I think it's actually the academics or the quasi-academics more appropriately have, have failed to serve policymakers. Now part of that's because they're willing to engage in, in the hardest task of all, which is making a complex idea simple and understandable. Um, whereas the super serious, like, serious scholars we know will get lost in, in charts and equations and never enter a conversation with anyone but 50 people at the Peace Science Society. Right? Um, and that's a bit of a challenge because that means there's a certain level of rigor there, but if rigor can't be communicated, it's not warranted. So I do think there's a lot to be done there, but I think this is one of those just enduring challenges that will always be there. Um, in the end of the day, you do always have academics who step forward to do government service um, across the political aisle in the United States, and I think that will continue. Um, and that's why, frankly, especially the young folks who are studying this stuff need to start publishing now and not get pulled into a, a quick little blog or a thickant little story about something, but actually do like real research and then let that stuff come out. And it'll be much more substantive, you'll have a much more sustained conversation. That said, we will be rolling out a lot of our public engagement through op-eds and other types of, uh, uh, of, other, and other types of events. <laughs> um, and that's our I, signaling I, strategy in some yes, ways, but also yes. we have an intention to collect all this in a book, a commission style book yeah. later. So uh, you can look forward to that. And I, I think there'll be an enduring contribution here, especially to say cyber strategy and cyber policy classes on the evolution of this process and the background work we did here. And everyone can cite us and hate us, but it's still a citation according to Google Scholar. So. <laughs>
I think just the other, the other uh, I'll, 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 sort of my last thought, and then I want to turn it to Mark for one last question, um, is, uh, you know, what's interesting is the role of PMEs here. Um, you yeah. know, g given that we are at, uh, we are at SciCon, right, it's the Army Cyber Institute uh, conference, uh, you know, the, the PME, I would say most of the subject matter experts who've been involved in this yeah. process have come from um, PME institutions, whether it's, uh, you know, West Point, Marine Corps University, Naval War College, NPS, um, I'm sure I'm <laughs> missing some others, but uh, but it's the, the sort of the bridging the gap function. I think um, yeah. resides a lot in in those institutions. So um, so I think you know to, totally in a self-serving way. I'm just going to say that. Um, but I want to ask Mark the last question and then turn it over to the audience for your questions. And please like feel free to ask us questions about about <laughs> process and you know and, and and what we're doing and how we're thinking about these things. We may not be able to tell you. Um, the exact sort of policy recommendations that we're going to end up on because the commissioners haven't sort of uh, come to consensus yet. We're still working that through. But I just, um, just Mark, I just wanted to ask you, could you kind of give us, situate us in the, in the timeline in terms of what's coming up sure. on the horizon, you know, December, January, going into the spring? What does this all look like and what does it culminate in? So I think that uh, the, you know, we'll continue through our process, um, which is uh, predominantly non-academic, despite the discussion that happened up here. Well, you three or four, good. you know. Yeah, the, um, <laughs> but certainly appreciated having the academics in the room. Uh, the, uh, but, but in fairness, what, what we should have a, uh, our, our um, assignment is to have a report by March and, um, and then have hearing. There's a requirement for uh, three sets of hearings across armed services. Um, Homeland Security and Intelligence Committees, um, where the Chairman, Senator King, and Representative Gallagher will engage with what their recommendations were in those various areas. So I think that there'll be a significant amount of um, pre uh, press and discussion and legislative work between uh, middle of February and, uh, and the uh, end of March on that. And then we'll go back out and engage the private sector and academia and think tanks who supported us and assisted us, as Ben said, about 300 uh, meeting so far. We'll go back and engage most of those organizations to explain, you know, where their, you know, where their recommendations ended up, uh, how they can best support and advocate to get them done. Because I do think a lot of this requires, I mean, th this is one of these issues that the government can only handle so much. This isn't a cruise missile attack or submarine attack or, you know, you know uh, armored operations where the military solves 95 to 98 percent of the problem, right? This is inherently something where the military, where the federal government is a, the military is a, the federal government's a moderate to small size portion of the solution and the military is a very small uh, portion of that uh, solution inside. So, you know, it's one of the, it, from my perspective, this is the most challenging thing. This is where when we kind of talk of, you know, whole government something you kind of throw around at NSC meetings, interagency meetings all the time for the last two decades and you can kind of, you know, and somebody says, well, of course we'll take a whole government approach and and it's almost a dismissive comment uh, or dismissed comment. The reality on this is, you know, the, the, the government has um, some say in this and then the society broadly, the agreement of the private sector to make investments that are counter to the bottom line of their organization on a day-to-day -day basis is a very challenging thing to do. And trying to, you know, make a compelling argument that generally has to be unclassified, you know, the, there's not a way to make the, you know, the, the availability of kind of the the highly classified information that uh, government analysts look at every day broadly available to the private sector in a timely, reasonable, useful manner on a daily basis is unlikely. So this has to be, you know, communicating and understanding. So hopefully between, you know, February, March, April, May, we'll, we'll get out, you know, the uh, congressional leadership that we have in this, in this committee, we'll get, we'll get that word out and, and be able to effectively communicate it. But, you know, that's a pretty big, that, that's a pretty big charge in my mind, getting people to understand this. The final thing I'd say is there'll be recommendations that are probably not executable by Congress that are too big. On the other hand, they'll be there for after the significant cyber event, you know, that happens. Um, you know, the, unfortunately, that is how we get really significant legislation done. You know, Hipsy and Sissy, I think, came in the wake of the church, uh, the church committee hearings. You know, his gag, I mean, the development of Homeland Security and the uh, a lot the um, the integration of the of the hill into uh, homeland security and his gag subcommittees came after 9/11. It generally takes a pretty significant event to break the rice bowls that organize the government, and they get get how the government thinks. And I think it takes a significant event 
to get the American people to focus on this. No polling suggests that there is a, uh, that there's a congruity between the threat as the gov senior government officials understand it and the threat as uh, the general population understands it. There's a real disconnect, a significant disconnect there that will only be closed, I think, by a significant event. So with that uh, doom and gloom, uh, I'd like to turn it over to you all for your, for your questions. I think there are, uh, are there yes. mics or? Yeah, okay. Yes, um, I have the box, Mike. Um, oh, it's a box, wow. I was like, what are you holding? Okay, fascinating. Um, <laughs> so I, I really uh, was interested to hear your, your discussions earlier. Uh, and following on the thread of the information panel and some of the allusion earlier about the different perceptions of threat under Eisenhower's solarium, um, how did the commission identify and work through their pre-existing, perhaps binary biases that they may have from a 20th century view of conflict? Um, and so to that end, you know, also how are you defining adversaries in cyberspace um, beyond uh, the traditional uh, strategic competition one? Um, that the NDS has laid out. So binary things like the IT versus cyber defense, win and lose, defend and attack. So. You want to? Yeah, so, uh, you know, I don't, I don't, I would say we didn't take a binary overly weighted 20th century view, although I'm not necessarily sure historically weighting expectations of threat is a bad thing. Um, usually works out a little bit. What we tried to do in those scenarios that Erica mentioned was capture the multifaceted nature of the types of actors and the types of attack surfaces and the way people approach this. So, for example, in the slow burn, we actually used fake colors, kind of a throwback to the rainbow plan, so you had different colors for different states and simultaneous competition. It was not ever, though, just state-driven. Um, and it was always predicated not just upon action, reaction, counteraction between two parties, it was predicated upon how contextual aspects of the environment created different opportunities and constraints upon different actors. So in those, it was linked to both social dynamics, economic dynamics. So in slow burn, the idea was you have this kind of cresting series of events getting worse, which frankly kind of reads just like today with the heat turned up a little bit. Um, so the cyber insurance market goes bust, hypothetically, and there's a wave of criminal actors who are linked to that but take advantage of it. They're using um, toolkits that spill over from state to state engagement. There's new types of attack surfaces that are emerging as more of our lives are connected online. There's disinformation elements to it. There's questions about the fundamental integrity of political institutions, not just linked to technology but to actual trust and understanding of them. So we very much tried to think about connectivity as shaping competition um, as one of the mantras, which is not necessarily, I would say, a normal 20th century way of looking at conflict in relation to the distribution of material capabilities in the absence of a higher structural authority. So that was kind of the way we went into it. And the second one had those same actors but at least the initial heat turn up was um, the prospect of a looming regional war and then how multiple actors take advantage of that. So I hope that answers your question. And there's also a lot of background research in, especially Task Force One, in terms of data analysis on threat actors. So we have all that background research. And I actually wanted to give a coin to Ryan Mayanesh from uh, Naval Postgraduate School for all the background research he did and data analysis he did, but he left the room. So there's his <laughs> coins. And, uh, oh. <laughs> So what happens when you leave early. So. Yeah. No coin for him. <laughs> so one thing I'd say on this is that um, it's a good point. To, the fixation on the nation state would be a mistake. I think one of the things, when I say there's got to be a significant event, I don't think it's going to be a nation state event that's a significant event. I think it's going to be um, a disaffected actor. Um, I think that the, one of the real challenges we have is that the interconnectivity and therefore the risk and vulnerability of our systems is growing exponentially. The availability of tools, whether it's our own leakage, um, nation state selling, you know, adversary nation state selling, or our, you know, development by just loan, loan actors is also increasing exponentially. And our investment in cybersecurity is at best linear. Um, you know, it might be slightly increasing linear, but it's at best linear. So you have two exponential risk problems, a linear solution problem. Clearly, the gap's growing greatly. I think we're very vulnerable to a disaffected actor, whether it's driven by. Um, you know, terrorist states, I mean, that's a small chance where he's driven by just his own 
his or her own disaffected nature, um, or whether it's driven by criminal desires, a actor like that is going to cause a significant infrastructure um, event, and that's to me going to be one of the wake-up calls in our country. So if we only concentrate on this nation state, while that probably covers us in terms of the worst case scenario, that doesn't cover us in terms of the most likely scenario. So we're definitely working over the, the plus three portion of the two plus three, although we don't use that terminology because it doesn't, I don't think it's, it's, as, it's as, um, uh, as clear in cyberspace on the defensive side. So within the DOD, I think a big problem that people have is talent management. I talk a lot about that problem. Um, and uh, like around the water cooler, people often talk about the idea of a cyber service, like a whole service dedicated to this problem. Surely that's come up at some point um, with your committee? So, no. Now, of course, it's come up. <laughs> I would say there's two things we're looking at. We don't have the solution, so I don't want to give it uh, on the on the talent man on talent management. I'd say we're looking at both the recruit the recruitment and initial uh, training of the federal cyber workforce, and then we're looking at the long-term training and, and retention. And I think long-term training and retention lends itself to that kind of model. You know. Um, CISA is piloting a cyber talent management, a CTMS program with, with only three pay bands, as I recall. You know, something vastly different than the current uh, regime that the uh, federal cyber workers work under, under a traditional cyber uh, federal employment contract. So we're taking a look at that. I think on the other end, the uh, recruitment. I'm a big fan of, um, I know this is all Service Academy uh, cadets and midshipmen here, but there's a, of ROTC and the idea of running, of taking the Scholarship for Service program, which is an existing program that works a little bit like ROTC, and expanding it. I helped develop it 25 years ago. I was working at the NSC, and um, I think that uh, you know we had 30 people then. We have about 300 now. It, it's absolutely scalable, up to 3,000 a year. In my mind, up to 3,000 a year. Uh, and it, it's a rising tide thing. The more cybersecurity departments we have healthy at private univer pu public and private universities, both associates and bachelors and graduate programs, the healthier the overall workforce will be in addition to the cyber workforce. And I think we do need to take a look at what's the actual requirement for certain government work and how do you get paid initially because there's an argument that certain um, IT certificates are of more value than just a B, uh, BS degree, from, uh, and by that I mean Bachelor of Science uh, degree from a <laughs> university. And so those are the things that we have to, so there's a, that transition between recruitment and retention, long-term retention, we have to work. All those issues are in play. Since the solutions haven't been reached yet, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm uh, 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 hesitant to go too far. I would say if you read Fifth Domain, a book by Richard Clark and Robert Kanacki, they deal with some of the federal cyber workforce. And I, I don't think we'll be too inconsistent with what they say in that book. Uh, hi. Um, so, Mark, thank you very much for your, your sort of mention um, on the uh, writer paper rather than just put some stuff out. I'm here, it's the first paper I've written, so it's been a therapeutic sort of process. But, but actually, it's allowed me, among other things, to look at, Ben, your, your issue uh, on standards. Um, and so uh, the extensive of career in the military and other areas, and standards have been a, a great cohering thing, but the problem is if you end up with multiple standards, you end up with a train crash. Yes. So currently I'm head of cyber assurance and governance for a large global logistics company, so I can see a civilian perspective of this. Um, and when you're looking at trying to uh, create a common baseline and an element of trust in that ecosystem where you can slot in and slot out and have an understanding of some of these things, you are confronted with IC 27001, COBIT, the new CMMC, and this cybersecurity framework in the UK, the, you know, the, the DCPP, the Cyber Assurance you know, Assessment Framework. It's incredibly confusing and complicated for even large corporations to deal with this. And most of these corporations are dealing globally, but also with vertical and some of your, your, your adversaries, with the Chinese, with the Russians, so on and so forth. When you start to look at the modern technology, a lot of the SMEs are much smaller and still global. So, so, you know, I think it's, it's, it's a really, really important issue to, to come and, uh, and come up with a term which is good enough is probably where we need to be. You know, perfection is the enemy of progress. And so I was just really looking for your views about how we come to a common standard to understand the baseline of the ecosystem and stop creating multiple frameworks. The framework's good enough, 
so that we can all coalesce on that uh, and then start to describe and share that, that baseline. You. Yeah. Um, this is a phenomenal point. Um, I, I will answer simply by saying standards are strategy. Full stop. Just as one of the more adult moments in the Cold War was the adoption of STANAG procedures to ensure interoperable loadout, steel standards, and ammunitions, we have to start really investing in the hard diplomacy to actually go with partners and allies to non-state technical standard bodies. So not just the frameworks that governments want to generate to pat themselves on the back occasionally, but the actual work of going to those technical standards bodies with a common set of negotiation position. And frankly, that that's a coordination challenge. It's currently a coordination challenge that's difficult for any one government, much less to do across treaty-bound alliances, much less to expand to a broader range of partners, which will be in the private sector. So I think that's one of the most important things that really comes out in the hard work that Task Force 3 does. So really looking at norms-based regimes and entanglement. How do you set those standards as part of a larger community? And you're right, everybody's going to be a little unhappy with it, but it creates a collective bargaining position and a position of advantage that makes it harder to achieve facts in that space from malign actors. So I think you're absolutely right. Standards are strategy, and a fool takes his eye off them. Um, you can develop the most exquisite kit and hide it on your own, but eventually someone's going to out it or it'll lose its utility. The harder thing is to negotiate those types of standards and bring everyone up together with them. And to talk to what you were mentioning with domestic standards, we're, we're looking at harmonization of standards across federal agencies. First of all, I, you can't just blame the federal agencies, the legislators deeply involved in this, and they're uncomfortable ceding oversight. Yeah to another, you know, to some, uh, we'll just let it be done in this one area, you know, in this, by this one federal agency that's oversighted by this other legislative body. So, you know, another committee or subcommittee. So harmonization is gonna be, it's easy to say that you want it, and it's gonna be much harder, I think, to affect. So I hope we have good recommendations. I'm sanguine about the likelihood of significant improvements. I do think the international thing support. One thing I'd say is, the, if you look at um, authorit authoritarian countries, they're attacking these uh, international fora aggressively with a large government plus completely yeah. aligned business, um, you know, a team of four or five times the size of the American team showing up and aggressively pushing a set of standards that's antithetical to our beliefs in, in um, freedom of movement, transparency, um, and, uh, and uh, uh, human rights. So I think there's a real concern here, both domestically and internationally on this. It's a good point. Uh, so the commission obviously exists to develop a strategy for protecting and, and engaging in securing critical infrastructure. But where do things like cyber-enabled IO sit, where it's not attacking the confidentiality, integrity, and availability of you know, system X, but it's much more resembles an intelligence or a psychological operation. Uh, case in point, the 2016 presidential elections or any litany uh, since. But, you know, how, how have you guys been engaging on those kinds of, you know, non quite crossing the threshold type so, issues? Uh, go ahead, take that. So, I, well, I have to be careful. We're not, you know, I don't want to have mission creep in terms of broad information operations. And, you know, from my previous time at PACOM and UCOM, I can say that. Our adversaries practice information operations much more aggressively and effectively than we do. I would say that we intentionally self-prescribe our efforts there in terms of fulsome information operations campaigns, both offensively and thinking defensively about them. With that set aside, I would say that the fact that our strategic approach is emphasizing both uh, traditional deterrence and the uh, development of a, of a uh, comprehensive defend forward strategy gets at that kind of information operations. In other words, the cyber-enabled information operations you're talking about are campaigns that are conducted below the level of war, but below the <coughs> threshold of, uh, of armed conflict, and, um, and take advantage of the fact that as a democracy, we're, we're slower in our response, we're more deliberate and transparent in our actions, and as a result, we're often um, one or two steps behind the adversary. I think one of the, one of the positive aspects of the military side of Defend Forward is that it gives you the opportunity to, be, to begin to engage the adversary um, in, that, uh, in, that, um, uh, in that operational space and make, you know, either make it harder for him or her to operate or create the conditions where you have better understanding of how they're going to operate 
and uh, allow yourself to build a better deterrence by denial capacity or capability to deal with it. So I think we're dealing with the, cyber, the specific cyber-enabled effects and then dealing with some of the symptoms of the broader cyber-enabled I.O. campaign. I just wanted to ask a quick question about this hard research work that you're talking about needs to be done versus just the 1,200-word op-eds. Um, two things, uh, are, are you discussing at all uh, a 21st century paradigm for the hard work where you are getting it done quicker, the temporal aspect? Mm -hmm. It seems like things are just happening quicker. Mm -hmm. I think of how computer science publishes a lot more conferences because six months is a lot better than the 18-month turnaround of journals. I think of how computer science went from the waterfall method to the agile method. So the temporal aspect of getting that hard work done. Second question, how do we break free from the disciplinary silos that seem to be existing? The lawyers are all doing their deep research. The political scientists are all doing their deep. Uh, do you, did you looking at all at the multidisciplinary aspects and challenges of this problem? Yeah, well, that's a key issue. And the thing is, we're seeing a rise of centers arise these interdisciplinary aspects of how we engage at the Army Cyber Institute. Uh, at the Marine Corps, we've got the Krulak uh, Center. We're building these um, institutions. The challenge is we need to get better at finding rigorous scholars to build up these institutions, because interdisciplinarity is just not enough. We need to think about the quality that's involved there. And, uh, and I would challenge you a bit about the speed of publication because journals now uh, kind of insist on a one-month turnaround, at least for the first round of reviews. So we're getting a lot better at that. Um, publishers are very aware of this stuff. We have a very good relationship with Oxford. We will hopefully have a uh, disruptive technology series on Oxford. So we want to push out this rigorous, hardcore research. And uh, we will engage any field on this issue um, as long as it's rigorous and there's quality involved. The rigor takes time. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, I, I think that so, um, the, the two parts to this, right, the tempo and the silos. So I'll take the tempo first and then quickly on the silos. And, and I'm going to pull it out in a way that why it matters to policymakers and how to make sure you get rigorous results that are intelligible and timely to the types of decisions they would make. Um, I'd say actually this is where good quantitative work is really important and possibly reconceptualizing how we even think of qualitative, highly contextual case studies. So there was a move, I can't remember what happened to it in ISA, um, ISQ. About the qualitative well, research Well, they were going to do the short little like 2,000 word pieces. Mm. So there's been a number of publishers, at least in the social sciences, have tried to tear out some of their publication formats where you could do quick research notes. And the idea would be to do a quick research note where maybe you have a data set, you're analyzing some phenomenon, you've run some initial kind of tests, you've identified patterns, you're publishing that in a way that it still meets acceptable peer review standard, but it's not that you have to have the whole article done. And ideally, what you've seen happen a lot of the hard and social sciences is that's why you have these names on articles that go to like sometimes 20 people long. That's because you're quickly finding that since you could cost of connect connection goes down, you can reach out, you can swap data, someone might be better at optimizing the statistical test, someone might be better at some of the initial collection and research questions. So you see these collaborative teams grow so that the size of the team and hence crossing the silos doesn't necessarily make it take longer. It means you actually get more rigorous just how you design the research. Now what I worry is that we're not teaching that in PME. I, I don't think we have done right by the military professional to teach them contemporary kind of rigorous research methods that would allow them to do that. Um, and that's actually a challenge. And it's not just for social science questions. I mean, how many data science classes are there at intermediate leader education? Um, how are we teaching people to understand a connected world will reveal itself in these data artifacts that you can put together and try to make sense of with multiple different techniques. So I think there's, to make it more intelligible, also is gonna require some really hard looks in the mirror about what we do in professional military education so that you do, you seed the bureaucracy with officers who are at least understanding of some of those methods. Yeah, and the Slarian Project is a massive group project with, uh, we're basically producing a yeah. book with 40 co-authors and we're doing it within a year. The tempo can be dealt with if you search if you get the right people at, you know, at the right time. Great point. I had a question about uh, metrics. 
So you guys have talked about like doing a hard research. Along with the recommendations uh, that will be in the report, are there going to be metrics or measures of effectiveness for these policies so they can be rolled back if they're not going kind of down that road that, that you were thinking? I can, I can do that. So, um, so one of our, one of the recommendations that, or a set of recommendations that Task Force One is working on is not, um, you know, we aren't going to produce those metrics ourselves, but um, the idea is through, um, um, through a, a legislative process, be able to hold entities accountable so that they um, report meaningful <laughs> metrics so that, um, so that over time we can measure the effectiveness of, you know, of operations and campaigns. And so we have, um, we have, we have suggested a set of categories of metrics that we, that we would recommend, but, um, but, but, uh, you know, from, from the perspective of the commission, what we're trying to do is um, figure out what is the appropriate mechanism and vehicle for getting entities to um, define meaningful metrics and report on them to appropriate entities. And, um, oh, go ahead. Oh, you can go. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, we, we love data, so we're probably each going to say something about metrics. <laughs> uh, we also have the, um, the Bureau of Cyber Statistics as possibly a recommendation. So an idea of uh, figuring out how to collect data in this community a lot better. And the other recommendation we have, it's not the most popular, but I think in the long run it may be very impactful, is the idea of a cyber instability task force working with the intelligence community and academia and researchers to develop metrics, evaluation methods, and analysis on cyber data and cyber engagement that we can push this field further. And that's worked very well from the state instability to political instability yeah. task force. They, uh, if you know this community, they uh, develop the polity data on types of government. It's very, very impactful in um, the academic uh, arena, and I think something like that would be very useful for cybersecurity as we work more with government and intel. Yeah, I, I think that um, clear objective data is one of the least appreciated and important public goods. Um, and if you look at the development of American government institutions, th there's a long tradition in the United States of having the government play a role in how we collect data and publish it that allows other people to make market decisions. So it's not a gas plan dictated to you, it's just collecting enough data objectively that other people can then begin to make economic decisions. Even if they don't fundamentally trust the data, they at least know the standards by which it's collected so they can argue objectively with it. So I think the larger meta theme in this is that data is a public good. Where I do think uh, Brand is right and is missing here is that there was a real evolution in the study of political violence and terrorism that's often not talked about. It went from high profile, spectacular, oh my God, there's plane hijackings, there's these groups that don't look like us and think like me, we have to understand them, where area experts were kind of parachuting in and pulling out data and then you, you emerge kind of general terrorist experts, but the quality wasn't great by any new discipline. <laughs> It wasn't until things like the Political Instability Task Force and then the emergence after 9-11, back to your point about shocks creating policy and kind of throwing money at it to create GDT in the Stark complex where you now had rigorous academic standards to collect data on terrorist events, terrorist recruitment, and objective standards that then could be used by a variety of intel analysts or frankly even just a larger academic community to make me a lazy analyst and I can go pull from that and see what I agree and disagree with. We gotta have that with this domain, even though it's gonna be fundamentally harder given some of its characteristics. I have a, a rich question, and I don't expect a complete answer now, so I'll, I'll hope that there will be a richer answer in the report itself. But I'd invite you to conduct right now an AAR and ask yourself, what was success of this commission at the beginning? Has that definition of success changed? Um, What have been the major barriers that you've overcome that still remain? What is your honest assessment of your prognosis with respect to those uh, definitions of success? And are you going to capture lessons learned because you're probably not gonna solve the problem. There are gonna be a lot of people who are interested in making progress and continuing to work on this problem. What, what are you going to equip them with to help them continue? Yeah. Well, it sounds like you uh, one of the small group of people who have written PhDs on commissions, because that's the exact advice the, the two uh, scholars who had looked at this said. And so we are going to take a look at that uh, over the holidays when we're at the halfway point. Uh, because I think it has, I mean, I think the initial understanding that the chairman and I, who are kind of the three people who were 
kind of doing this full time and last you know, February, March, April, we're the only ones kind of doing it full time then uh, or consistently then. Probably if you asked us then and you ask us now what we thought the final product looked like, it's different enough that you have to ask how did you, why did it change, what forces were pushing you, and then I think if you ask again in three or four months, it'll change, probably not as much. And that's important to understand why, because sometimes those are, are um, compromises, vice, you know, uh, intellectually honest decisions, right? They're ones that are made because of political or, or administrative uh, compromises you have to make. So I think that's a very good tool. I think we'll be using it. Um, one of the problems with any commission is when it's over, it's over. You know, it's one of the few parts of the federal government that actually does stand down. Almost all our commissions stand down eventually. Um, and then there's no way to like get that kind of um, continuity. So we, but we, there's ways to get around that. We're working about how you provide, you know, product that's available for three to five years, which is about the lifetime of any valuable product, the maximum lifetime. Um, so but that's really good advice. It reminds me of the need to continue to do it and um, consistent with what the scholars in this field have told, in this field of commissions have told us we have to do. And that's why we're going to push forward on a book to reflect this process, an edited volume that contains all this analysis. So it can endure, it can live on, because this is just but a moment. But the things we write, the things we put down, those can have a longevity that we hope will endure a bit longer. Can you share your thoughts on this uh, state? Major generator. Yeah. Yeah, I have to be careful, because mine are probably different than the commissioners and chairman. I'm much more pragmatic, uh, you know, about, you know, small, I think a large series of small law changes can make a big difference. But there's other, there's certainly commissioners who have a very logical argument for dramatic change is more important because that might shock the system. And there's an argument for having as much possible on the shelf ready to go after a significant event. All three of those things don't feed together. You know, they, they can't all be served by the same report. So I have to have some kind of um, consensus or consensual agreement between those three kind of thought processes. So I, I, I don't think I'm in a position to give what the commission thinks. I think I'm, and I think that's something we would want to keep to ourselves initially, especially if it's, de if it's a strong debate. But long term, it's important to expose, you know, to, to explain what was left on the table. And I think we'll, we will have a, a vehicle for doing that. And the biggest challenge is basically simplifying complexity. Yeah. Now, this is a very complex organization, a very complex domain. How do we simplify it and project it out forward? How do we make it accessible? And that's a tough thing to do. You've but been we'll patient. get there. Go ahead, get your last, last question, I think. Yeah. All right, I'll try to spike it. Um, so I've heard mention of uh, historical events such as the Church and Pike Commission 9-11. Our national security apparatus was developed at a time when we had over there threats, when it took the Japanese naval fleet weeks to get to Pearl Harbor, and they were targeted at largely military distinguishable infrastructure. You know, fast forward, we've had government abuse. In reaction to that, we had legislation, the Church and Pike Commissions, and then uh, we moved forward to a time where it was 9-11, and a non-state actor could get from over there to over here by hopping on an airplane. Uh, similarly, we've had updates in, in legislation and, and how we deal with the nature of that threat. Today, we're living in an environment where we have near-peer adversaries operating on U.S. infrastructure nearly instantaneously. What is the commission contemplating in terms of how do we grapple with things like uh, consent, lawful access, encryption, while balancing the notions of privacy and civil liberties, in particular, knowing that our adversaries are operating on what is now predominantly private infrastructure? So I'll take that one. And I, I think what I'd say is, first, that's an issue we're dealing with in the next week or so. There's competing proposals coming in to exactly address those. So I'm, I'm uncomfortable saying where I think they'll end up because it, they need to preserve their decision-making space. But what I will say is exactly that issue of the, um, you know, encryption is a great example of an issue where there is a co very compelling kind of um, argument for uh, inc uh, 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 strong encryption with no accommodations for anything can potentially get, make you more secure against any type of adversary. However, if you don't make these accommodations when you have a legitimate law enforcement requirement for information, you don't, it's too late, you know, there's no longer a way, you can't uh, ex post facto accommodate. So we have to think about this. And then there's 
already accommodations that are part of routine upgrades to systems. So, you know, the, the owner operator of the device, uh, of, of software and hardware, are maintaining some sort of uh, accommodation. So we have to figure that out. But I do think that there's a requirement in our country for data. Well, I'll be advocating for some sort of data privacy. First of all, we can't live in a vacuum where uh, Europe and China are developing the um, standards that our companies are going to have to adhere to because they're inherently international companies. And uh, one of those is reasonably acceptable. One of those will be unacceptable. Um, you know, one de designed and executed in an authoritarian state will not be the kind of da uh, data privacy uh, standardization that we want to see proliferate around our allies, partners, or ourselves. So we have to get engaged in this. But where the commission lands, I think I need to preserve their their discussion space. But definitely, we're thinking about that. Was that you the final finished, question? You finished at All the right. exact.